we are now live. Great. And good morning. <laughs> good morning, everybody. My name is Jennifer Cronk, and I am here with both Amelia and Meg, who are going to introduce themselves in just one second. And we have started this Blab show called Positively Special Ed. Megan, do you want to start by introducing yourself? Um, sure. My name is Meg Hayden, and uh, Amelia and I met uh, about a year ago. And um, I had started an organization called Process This to help students with learning disabilities because I am a kid with a learning disability. I always introduce myself actually as a kid with learning disability instead of an adult. <laughs> it's like I'm Peter Pan or something. <laughs> so so um, back like two, three years ago, I was living at my parents. I had no job. We were like, sitting outside having dinner and I asked my parents, I said, I was like, what was that learning disability I had back in the day? As if like it didn't still completely and utterly affect me, especially since I was living at home with my parents at like 27 years old. And um, they were like, oh, it's called processing. And I was like, I've never heard of that. Um, and so then I started doing all this research and found that, um, that it was such a relief to know like what was wrong with me or like what, why I was different. Um, and so it allowed me to like take my exterior, my armor that I had built up and like start to open that up, like almost like open your heart up to everybody else. Um, Cause I had gone through life just like just being, um, just trying to make everybody know that I was smart. Like it had, like everybody had to know. So everybody had to know about the last NPR that I heard or the last article I read. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit about me. And um, yeah. I really, so and when you shared this stuff in the session where I met you both, uh, Amelia and Meg, I identified so much with that. Amelia. I'm Amelia Giordano, and I live in New Jersey. Um, I met Meg a year ago. I saw her process this Facebook page um, after being sent to it, and I called her up, or I messaged her, and she called me up, and we talked for an hour, and it was so amazing because her story was my story, and the experiences she had were the same experience experiences I had and we just instantly connected mm -hmm. and what was so interesting about it was that we really did have so many of the same life's challenges and we dealt with them in very similar ways and um, you know we didn't necessarily have a lot of help along the way because we were kids in the education system in the 90s so because our challenges were the same and our triumphs were the same we kind of just started brainstorming and you know we realized that we wanted to to work together to change this for kids because you know as meg says she doesn't want her grandchildren's grandchildren to feel this way and you know i i want no student in the education system to feel the way we did um so that's sort of how we got working together um i also have a learning disability um so it's just it's been a really exciting journey because we've been meeting so many cool people and you know trying to make a difference in our schools which has been a really interesting challenge in and of itself mm -hmm. um so yeah that's a little bit about, about me um my name is jennifer cronk and i met these two awesome women when i was at the educon conference and uh, i have to say that both uh i think amelia and Megan are kind of like heroes because uh, when I was in when I was in your sessions, I had never. I was always the. I I've always been in sessions. I'm a prof professional developer by trade, and I'm a specialist in educational technology, and I've always kept like my learning disability as like my dirty little secret, and I so identify with what Megan was saying. Like oh, I would overextend myself to try to prove that I wasn't stupid. Um, and there were times in, I actually, I don't know if either one of you done this, but in one of my positions, I would be the person to make the dumb blonde jokes, 
because I'd be covering up the sense of inadequacy that I'd have. So I would make fun of me before you could make fun of me for doing something that I didn't have any control over. And um, I would do that a lot. And I remember one of my administrators started throwing out the dumb blonde jokes with me. And I was like, kind of like looked like aghast at him. And he's like, well, you always do it. And he was right. I'm the first person to put me down because God forbid that I'm actually authentic about, you know, this is something that I deal with on a daily basis. And, and it really took seeing both uh, you, Amelia, and Megan to be these brave people out there saying, hey, why aren't CSE meetings student-led? And you both introduced yourselves as learning the disabled adults. And I was like, oh my gosh, these are my people. These are really <laughs> my people, you know? And I really respect you both so much for doing that because that's just not something that I have been brave enough to do by the outset. And and after sitting in your session and then like obsessively hanging out with you that Saturday <laughs> the entire time, that's when I was like, you know what, this is this is something that is so important. And uh, mad props to you uh, for Process This because I love that name. That's such a legit name. But it really is something that, you know, I don't like to admit that I do struggle with just about every day. Like I come across some issue that has to do with my pro my processing or transcribing. I remember the calendar idiosyncrasy that I shared with you guys, like just came up, you know, just yesterday where I was like, is that a nine o'clock or a nine thirty? You know, because that's one of those weird things that I have. And uh, so I just wanted to say that I appreciate you guys so much and that you really, in a way, freed me up to actually be okay with being a learning disabled adult and to talk about it in a public forum. Well, because the thing that's interesting is that what we found actually is that it's okay to be a learning disabled kid because that's why I, wanna, I always introduce myself as a kid because it's like not okay to be an adult with a learning disability. So like in school, you know, we have all of these apparent accommodations, right? But once you get out into the working place, like kind of all on your own and um, you shouldn't like, I mean, just in a professional setting, you shouldn't be who you actually are. And, um, and you definitely shouldn't have a learning disability. Like, especially in the workplace. Um, and I think I remember working at my school. I work at the workshop school in West Philadelphia. And I just remember saying, like, you know, am, is this okay to say? And I was like, well, if it's not, then, like, this is not the place for me, you know? And so once I told everybody that I was, lear like, that I have learned disability, auditory processing, um, it was so great because there were so many people that also – that just said like, that's cool. Like, thank you for sharing that. And I mean, there's other people that are gonna say like, it's a crutch, but I just don't care what you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's um, one of the reasons why we're doing this, right? Because, and I loved what a Dean said, um, a Dean is gonna come on later um, in the show. Um, not today's show, but another show. Um, and <laughs> Meg, I can see you. <laughs> We're waiting um, for you, Adine. But I think um, what's really, really cool is that Adine said to us, um, you know, your admission of your own learning disabilities shifted the conversation in the room for these teachers. And so, you know, thank you for calling us brave. I think you, you're also brave for standing up and sharing your story. But the three of us together collectively, including the other woman who shared that she had a learning disability, I think that just changed the entire conversation for the educators that were in the room. Um, I think they were more conscious of what they were saying. I think that they were more empathic. They, you know, they were really centered around, um, you know, caring for us as people in the room, caring for us as, as the children that we were when we went through the education system. And so it's really cool because I, you know, I think one of the reasons why we're here is because we want to shift that um, energy. We want people to feel like they can talk about it. We want adults to identify themselves as being learning disabled if that's, you know, part of their process and that's where they are and they feel comfortable doing that because it's just, it's who we are and people need to see us as our authentic selves. I think, and I think what's kind of interesting too is like, 
is we're giving our our little selves, like our 10 year old, 12 year old selves, that voice that we never had, that was like very true. And so when I started doing all this research, I started like just asking everybody like about learning disabilities, and like who had them and everyone started coming and talking to me and it was, it was so crazy. And I think what was really awesome is that like the stories are the same. We didn't have a voice. Um, people didn't get us. We were trying to hide everything. Like we didn't want anybody to know that we had a learning disability and it sort of, you know, has come into our adult lives. Um, but at the, uh, Educon, it was so, I felt like, I felt like I had some solidarity there that like there were other people that had learning disabilities and IEPs, um, in the room. And I was like, okay. I was like, I feel like, <laughs> I feel really good <laughs> about this. Definitely. No, I totally agree. That was such a great feeling. Um, and I think the reason why we're doing this now is because, you know, Meg and Jen and I have worked in education for some time and um, we're starting to see things change and we can make um, the experience for kids more student centered. And we want to talk about that. And we want to mm -hmm. talk about you know, our experience. We want to talk about the experience of our kids. We want to talk about our schools. We want to talk about what parents can do. We want to talk about what kids can do. You know, we're really here for all of those reasons. Um, and throughout this uh, TV show, you guys can ask us questions and we'll get to them. Um, at the end, but yeah, this is like an all place, uh, things for all, what am I trying to say? Things for all discussion. All special ed. <laughs> you know, something that came up for me while you were both, while you are both sharing, um, you know, we're talking about, we're, you know, and, and also in our chat, where Matt had mentioned it becomes an opportunity for people to say, how can I help you? I think for kids, you know, regular students, conventional students these days, I mean, the teachers were pretty much set on and we're all educators. I mean, all three of us are educators. And uh, next year, September hits, I'm going to be in education for 20 years. And oh, my God, not ready for that. Um, <laughs> But anyway, um, sad. Thank, <laughs> you. thank you very much. <laughs> I, I think that we're so focused on our conventional students or students that are basically not classified. I'm sure there's tons of students that are not unclassified students that would benefit from services. But uh, for our unclassified students, we're all of this whole like college and career readiness, which is really, uh, I really believe very firmly in like what uh, Chris Lehman was talking about, about really creating citizens, because it's really the informed citizens that change a society. We're just, it's very short-sighted to think about college and career readiness, because the careers that are out there now are not going to be out there in five years. They're going to be completely different. That's been shown time and time again. But our focus is on the college and career readiness because that's what we're supposed to do. But with our special ed kids, we're teaching them how to modify their approach to life. And that's the important thing. I think that the shift is so important when you're dealing with um, the conventional uh, tactics for education than you are with special education. Because really, when it comes down to it, that whatever modifications they learn, these are modifications they are going to be using throughout their entire life, whether they do or don't learn. And I'm sure that both of you have also come up with, I have modifications that I've discovered on my own, that this is just the way I learn. And, and this is what works for me. And even though I might come across another person who's also dyslexic, who might be classified, it manifests itself. And so it presents in so many different ways that, you know, what works for me in a modification way does not work for other people. Like I tend to be somebody who, for some reason, I need to orthographically scribe things. And I'm all tech. I, I live in Google Docs. But when I need to remember something, I have to scribe it. You know, it's just one of those things. But I think that that's an important shift to also note is that I think that when we're dealing with special ed kids, when you have a teacher who's focused on modifications that will impact life, I think that's actually a more uh, sustainable and truer goal to have than this whole college and career readiness. Right. I think, yeah, I think I think you're definitely... Right, because I think, all, and also the thing like the transition goals that end up happening where students are actually allowed to become part of their IEP meetings by law. Once you have transition planning, you have to have your kids in the IEP meetings. Um, 
the transition goals are like one liners and it's a research research three different top like three different career paths you could take um and it doesn't go any further than just this like observation of what the outside world can look like and i think for um I think for students with learning disabilities, we actually have to do everything. Like you, it can't just be something that we look at. It has to, we, everything we do, we go in 100%. Like Amelia and I were talking about that, about how it's, our lives are not just um, on the surface. And like we can, we don't ever, we don't really work that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the principal of this school, one of the workshops he led, he, I can't remember the competency handout, but it was all about like root finding, you know, self-discovery and root finding. And that was actually, we did sort of a vote. And that was one of the things that people really wanted to focus on. And it was difficult to make assessments for that, but it's so important to have kids map out their own route and to figure out where they're going and why they're going there and how far they've gone. It's, I think you're right. It's so important for them to do it. And it's so important, important for them to focus on that because yeah. it's not just about those generic career and college readiness standards. You can't, you can't look to those um, to give the experience. You have to have the experience and, and, and learn from it. It's setting intention too, right? Mm -hmm. As to where you want to go. And the other funny thing too is, I whenever I ask somebody like what their job is, I'm like they're like, well, I'm the um, chief operator of this or whatever, and I'm like, so what do you do every day? Because <laughs> like I don't really care about what your title is or what the like overarching things are. Like, are are you standing? Are you sitting? Are you sitting at a desk? <laughs> are you moving around? Like, I need to know, like, exactly what, how many people are you talking to? <laughs> are you on the phone all day? Just, like, whatever it is, like, I need to know your whole day and what it looks like because that, to me, is important. Those, like, very, those, like, the detail mm -hmm. um, and the overarching. I feel like we live – like learning disabled kids live in this like higher this like higher place and then also like really in depth in the details and we get lost like somewhere in the middle. <laughs> I'd agree with that. I would totally, totally agree with that. So why don't uh why don't we talk a little bit about the session that I walked into that you both uh were facilitating was when are CSE meetings going to be student led? And now you're talking about like right now, it's not necessary until transition planning, but I have an eight year old that has an IEP and Jack, I would love for him to be able to simply say to his teachers, you know, um, just, this is not the way I learn best. Or like my daughter, I know that she learns best and she's sitting up front or we just recently gave her. Now I'm, I'm very fortunate. I have two amazing teachers for my children. I couldn't ask for better teachers. They will bend over backwards for my kids. But I think that there's something really to be added for a child, even my eight year old son beginning to advocate for himself because I can say how I think he learns best, but I could be wrong. I'm not, you know, I'm just his mom. I'm not in his not little body. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'd love to hear more about you. Guys. Living in this world, though, like with the tech, like with, it's, it's a totally different world. <laughs> like we had like one of our feet in, like, like we had the internet, but I mean, we were just instant messaging, at least when Amelia and I were growing up. But now it's like you're you're born and you're playing games in the iPad already. Yeah, at least when we wanted to instant message, we had to, like, sit down at our computer and, like, focus on it, whereas these kids can, like, bring their – they can bring the computer anywhere into the wild that they want. And that that's a really good point. Like, this whole world is shifting so much that it's, it is even more more difficult for kids to get, to get and stay grounded. Okay, I just have but to I, point out that when you guys were talking about instant messaging, like my version of instant messaging back in the redneck boondocks that I grew up in was a CB radio. That was the redneck social networking. There was no instant messenger at that time. Did you get on like Saturday nights? Did you call up like truck drivers and stuff? I totally did. I totally, they, were like the, they were like the coolest people to talk to because I'm in the, like this tiny little hamlet in uh putnam valley and you were lucky if you if you had an antenna that would reach that far usually you're just talking to the same kids that you talked to while you were in school 
And oh my gosh, yes, yes. Interesting. And one thing that you said that I think is really important is, you know, the te I think we as educators and as people, adults with learning disabilities, you know, the, the teachers can't know everything. And that's one of the reasons why students really need to self-advocate because, you know, we have really high expectations of our teachers and we should have high expectations of them, but they can't know everything and they can't be in their students' bodies and they don't know what their students are thinking. And it's hard for them to, you know, it, it takes a whole year for them to really know who's in their classroom and to really understand the, every, you know, everyone's experiences in the landscape of their students. So I think, you know, we put people put a lot of pressure. Parents put a lot of pressure on teachers to know everything, and they just can't know everything. No, absolutely. Uh, we have a really good comment from uh, Bursting Autism. She has, uh, I'm assuming, from yes, she's got an autistic child, and she's talking about um, being stuck in this assistive tech loop where she can't really. The same technology is being thrown at her child, and she also says. This is a good thing for us to talk about. What for? What about a child who can't self-advocate? Hmm. So I don't think that that ever happens, right? I I don't believe if you have someone who's child, not if nonverbal. Do you not see their face? Right? Do you not see their like their their expression? So I feel like self-advocacy doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be verbal, right? Um, and so I think we have to think like outside of the box and how other ways that we communicate, like you can see my face right now. And I unfortunately express myself in way too many ways with my face. And so having a student, like being able to see that a student is frustrated um, and like, and being able to relay that to teachers, um, I think is, is part of, is part of their own self-advocacy. So um, bursting with autism, I think it would be a great idea to encourage your kid to keep doing like certain, um, or to identify certain expressions or certain ways that they are expressing themselves um, and identify that with like being frustrated or um, being happy or, or content with like the outcome or whatever it is. Is that, does that make any sense? Yeah. And while we're waiting for that reply, something else that, you know, also comes to mind, um, depending, depending on the child, depending on the child, I mean, that's a really good point. So uh, I have experience with one of my students who I worked with who was cerebral palsy and she was non-ambulatory and non-verbal. Um, and she would not have had a quarter of the services uh, that she has had she not had a mother who was a true warrior advocate for her. Um, her mom took it upon herself and I'm not sound, and I, I realized that yeah, as a working mother that you know, how much can I do? You know, I'm working full time. I have my children and then try, trying to do research and all this other stuff can sometimes be very daunting. But I have to say that uh, this one parent, Carol, she was phenomenal and she actually did tons and tons of research and she was relentless and did not stop until she got exactly what she wanted from the school. Now, in my case, um, I was going through the school system in the 70s, and that was right after around 1975, 1976, when the special education laws were passed. I was five years old or six. It's hard to remember that far back. But um, my mother was lucky enough to have somebody who was a teacher who was beginning the whole special ed movement. Um, who was right in with the legislature. I, we just happened across this woman and she took me on as a tutor for free. But what she also was, was relentless. And she was at the school all the time. And as a teacher and as a former administrator, squeaky wheels, they get the oil. You just got to be that squeaky wheel. You have to be, don't go for the victim. This is what they're doing. Go to the very proactive, I am not accepting anything less. And everything that you do needs to be documented and in paperwork and show up, be, be visible, be there often, you know, and, and you will get what you need for your child. It's just a matter of unfortunate, a lot of time because it's a very time consuming process, but you will get there. 
I th- and I think the other thing is um, what I've done with a lot of parents and we've done all these uh, amazing workshops is that um, you get tired as a parent mm-hmm. and you're just tired of like fighting for something that is a right. Um, and I think something that's really important is being able to find a community uh, whether it's in your parent teacher organization and be able to connect with other um, other parents. Um, so even if they if, even if you guys like are able to swap and have like one parent sit in with another parent, like to just have like more bodies, um, I think that that's something that's really important. Um, and to all the parents, like you guys are, just incredible, like silent, war- silent and loud warriors. Um, and I think that you should, you're like going to he- like whatever the VIP of heaven is, like you're going there. <laughs> um, and, um, but I know that it's really, 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 really hard. And I think something that's really interesting uh, that I hear a lot is that, um, just like parents are, parents are just struggling themselves. Um, and I think the other thing that we're missing too is that a lot of parents, some some parents don't aren't advocates because it's like not in their personality to like yell and like yell at the front door. Um, but the other thing that we have to realize is that um, I work in an urban school, and there's no way that parents can take off time to be there at the door, pounding on the door. Um, so I think, uh, something that we are really trying to do is to pull resources like into one community. Um, and I think if you're able to do that, then it's not as stressful. You can all collectively like bargain essentially say like the, the, hey, we have five people here that need the same thing. We need this assistive technology and this mm-hmm. is our right. And like, we'll go in together with a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And on the flip side of that, I mean, I think it's really important to remember that ultimately the child is in this life, you know, in their body by themselves for the long haul, that no matter what happens as things evolve, you know, they have to be their own best advocate because they really are their best advocate. And um, I think just respecting and honoring that journey and consistently trying to help them feel like they're not alone and that, you know, a lot of times we have these beautiful big ideas and, you know, it takes, it takes a long time for people to start seeing them. And I think that's one of the reasons why Meg and I were just so grateful to find each other because we finally realized that, okay, great, let's keep moving with this because this is right. And we, we are onto something here. Um, But not every kid is going to feel that way. I mean, not every adult feels that way. I think a lot of adults with learning disabilities still feel isolated. So as long as you can show that child throughout their process, you know, you're not alone, you have good ideas, you know, this beautiful big thinking that you experience um, is what the world needs. I think that on a very basic level, it needs to be like a daily reminder for kids, um, you know, because for them, the experience of having to deal with all these adults who are trying to work everything out is so difficult. And you know, it's confusing and challenging and they don't know how to make sense of that all the time, especially if they're young. So just that like daily reminder that um, they need to keep moving forward um, and advocating for themselves. And we know whatever that means, if that means advocating in the family or advocating at school, you know, advocating in general. We have some interesting stuff happening in the chat that I just want to address. So one of our parents is talking about not getting necessarily the attention that their child needs. And then how do you deal with that in a tenuous situation in CSE meetings? So as a parent, I've been into all my children's meetings. Um, I think there's a lot of different approaches here. You know, for my situation, there because we were in just the beginning of special education, and the funny thing for me was when I when I was diagnosed uh, with dyslexia and also processing issues as well, um, I this wonderful woman Jackie Foley took me on uh, for three years. The first year she had my mom bring me to her two times a week for free because we were so incredibly poor. Um, so 
she taught me how to read. So eventually I started going to these meetings and my services, this is another issue that we could definitely address. My services were beginning to be taken away from me because they were under the, the misconception that because I could finally learn how to read in the third grade, uh, that I, I don't need help anymore. And there's so many different layers to uh, special education and to a child's needs. And I absolutely needed services. I needed, I still need services, I think. Um, but when you're dealing with a tenuous situation, I mean, it seems like uh, it appears that bursting autism is, is hitting a lot of roadblocks. And we're having a lot of chat in, in the, the chat stream about lawyering up or not lawyering up, I probably, I would have to say that when you hit, feel like you're hitting a lot of walls, this is just for me. Honestly, I have to get centered. I have to meditate. I have to, uh, for me, I pray. And then I get real and I ask for help. You know, and I'll get, I'll ask, I'll go in, I'll be the teary eyed parent and not fake. Like it's real. Like, you know, I'll cry. and like, I need your help please help me. And I also have to understand that they may be right. So in this situation with my son just recently, um, I, I got a bunch of these. He's now out of first grade. He's in second grade. And a lot of his scores are coming back like really, really bad. And he was rocking math in first grade and now in second grade he's not and i'm seeing this huge decline and it's scaring the heck out of me and i had a meeting with this teacher and i'm pushing right now and i am going to advocate for this in the next meeting i he needs to have his questions rephrased and reread to him without a doubt he can't comprehend he's still cognitively trying to decode everything he's trying to read um but when i'm sitting there with the teacher i'm telling her one thing and she's telling me in her expert opinion something else. And I still do need to listen to that. And the principal checked in with me. And the principal was like, how was the meeting? And I was like, it was hard. It was really, really hard. Because it's hard to hear where my child's at sometimes. You know, I have this expectation of where I want him to be at. He may never be that. He's going to be his own being. He's going to be his own person. And I have to respect, even though I'm there to advocate for my child and to do what uh, I think is best for him, this is a team. The, and I do believe that his teachers do have uh, the best intentions for, for him, without a doubt. And the specialists that he's working with, I do know that they truly care for him. And I'm in great district. I love my district. But I think that, you know, we're talking about, I have a tendency, I can be a mommy gorilla and I want to like go in there and force the situation. But I also need to take a step back and realize that this is a team approach. And a lot of times if I'm vulnerable and I let them know my frustrations and just ask them, please, help me with this. I'm doing the best I can. I, I and, and also validate that I know that you're doing the best you can, that you care about my child. I appealing to the humanness in the administration and the teachers only, you know, helps. Yeah, I think I think I think you hit a really good point is um, sometimes parents come in and they're like, well, this is what I need for my kid. And you're doing this wrong. And I always try to tell parents like, Imagine somebody coming into your job and telling you that you're doing your job wrong. That in itself is going to, it's just going to change the conversation um, to somebody being defensive. And that's like, that's so obvious to me. Um, and the other thing that we have to, like, I, I'm always like, you, it is your team. It's your partner. Like, this is the only way that your kid's going to get through the class, right? And so if you're going to isolate them and insult them, then I, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. We have so many great comments in the comment section. Um, one, one really great question uh, was also, is it okay to have your child demonstrate their abilities in the IEP meeting? Um, and the answer to that is absolutely. Um, positively a special ed. <laughs> uh, we're kind of all about that, you know? I think it's super important for kids to, to know what their abilities are. Um, I had one student 
uh, we'll get to this later, but we're going to talk a little bit about our breakthrough stories for some of our kids. Um, but I'm going to mention mine now because it seems appropriate. Um, one of my students, he struggles with reading, struggles with um, writing, uh, and then he just gets lost in class, and then he uh, disconnects. He just shuts off. So something that um, I was I was talking about with him, I was like, well, what are you good at? And of course, every kid with learning disability is like, I'm good at building I'm good with my hands. I can build anything. And I'm like, cool. When we were at... <laughs> Jen, your makeup looks great, though. You look fantastic. For anybody that's <laughs> God, wondering, why well, did makeup just break off? Because my my right eye has just been like pouring tears this entire thing. And while this is a very sensitive topic, I'm actually not crying. My eye is just doing its own thing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, something that was cool and that I saw uh, one of another student do one time was actually build a structure to talk about a book that he read. And so he built an actual physical structure out of wood. And Amelia and I were actually in that, um, we were in that conversation with a student from Science Leadership Academy. And he was talking about like, even that there were the three, the three prongs of the structure demonstrated like the, the three themes we were going to talk about. And so I was like, oh my gosh, my kid has to do this. And so when I went to the teacher and I was, when I went to my kid's teacher, I was like, Hey, do you think we could do this? And she was like, absolutely. Um, she's like, of course I want this kid to succeed. Like that's, that's what I'm here for. You know, like, of, of course I want my kids to succeed. And it seems like you're the only one who can sort of talk to him and break through. And so I think that that's, that's you have to come up with different solutions in order to show. Um, we have a mic. We have a, an echo. echo. Amelia, is there a way that you Amelia, can possibly mute? That you possibly mute? Okay, go ahead, Megan. Um, I was just talking about the structures. Yeah, so <laughs> the student, kids. student building that structure, and you went back to the teacher. Um, yeah, and I asked the teacher if 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 this would be like a, an okay way for a kid to show what they knew about the book or what they had read within the book, and um, she was like, "That's a great idea." She's like, "I'd love to do that." Of course, he can present like that. So, I think um, I think we just have to come up with solutions instead of saying, "Hey, like you're not doing this. You're not doing this correctly." Um, to be able to collectively with with uh, everyone on the team to be able to come up with like real solutions um, and not really isolate people as much even even though we want what we want <laughs> um, we need to make sure that that everyone is that we're finding the strengths in our team actually um, Amelia I had a question for you my question, uh, Amelia works at an, well, you work with guided inquiry and how do you think guided inquiry helps, um, students with learning disabilities, like in general, but I also think like organize their thoughts. Yeah. So there's, uh, three things that come to mind. Um, first guided inquiry is very, um, scaffold in nature. So the skills that they build are cumulative and it kind of builds upon itself over time. Um, the information search process is a theory um, devised by a information scientist at Rutgers University. And so it's this whole idea that we have information seeking behaviors that get exhibited regardless of your age or your research intent. And so it's a psychological process in essence. And as the kids move through that, they feel frustration, doubt, optimism, um, confusion, um, clarity. And so it really helps them to sort of experience all the emotions that you might experience throughout your life and then manage them and ask for help when you need to. And so because the information search process is characterized by those six stages and those six stages are um, 
you know, thoughts, feelings, and actions that kids experience. Um, it's, it's really interesting because they know when to ask for help. And I think for a kid with learning disability, that's the biggest thing. You just have to know when to ask for help, whether you're a kid or an adult. Um, if you need clarification or you need something modified or you're just not understanding something, I mean, that's something for me. I, if I'm not understanding something, I have to ask it in a million and one ways. And um, I actually, when I first started interning, I would not hear things and register, or I would hear things, but I wouldn't. It wouldn't register. And so, if somebody, I was, I was working um, in New York City. If um, I was getting a lot of instruction, <laughs> I was just, th I just thought, okay, I just have to write this down. I just, or I have to remember it. I can't write it down, you know. And then it got to the point where I realized I just need to write this down because I don't have to pretend like I can register everything and know everything. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I think, yeah, it's just really important to ask for help and um, to recognize that you have certain strategies that you have to implement no matter what. And if you're comfortable implementing those strategies, if you're comfortable asking help, whether it's your librarian or your teacher or your parent or a friend, you know, that, that makes things easier. I think those concepts can, of- uh, can, you give an example, can you give an example, Amelia, of like, like a guided inquiry research? like? Because I know that your kids have had really amazing results and really amazing topics. Yeah, I mean, so this is like a this is a plug for progressive project based education. You know, I think it, it's really fascinating. Um, I have one student who did not have a learning disability, but whose mother passed away of breast cancer, and she studied bereavement in children. I had another student who studied dyslexia to better understand her own learning disability. And so you just, you know, you, you get to this point where the kids can actually start self-researching, which is something that I think Meg and I ultimately, I mean, I had always done that, but I think, um, you know, in adulthood, it was became really important to self-research. Um, personal topic choice, getting really attached to that um, is really important. So it doesn't matter whether it's a ninth grade project on ice cream or a 12th grade scientific literature review on your learning disability, as long as it's personally relevant, and you, um, you know, have that scaffold um, curriculum and can work through those things um, sequentially. I think, um, yeah, I mean, any project, any guided inquiry project is a good project as long as it's a personal topic. And that's why you do see so many kids study either personal illnesses or illnesses in their family, learning disabilities, um, and then just their passions. You know, we'll get kids that do black hole, you know, stuff on black holes, kids that do stuff on um, the economy, you know, you just that's I think that's a huge step that education still needs to make is making things real life applicable. But the more real life applicable it can be to a student with a learning disability, the better off they are. Um, I think what's kind of cool, though, in guided inquiry is that there's a space for asking a question, right, some research question. And then you go further into it, but you also have somebody there to sort of help you with the struggle. Like the whole, the whole, like all of guided inquiry, I feel like is, it's about the process mm -hmm. as much as it is about what you find at the end. Um, yeah, definitely. Oh yeah. No, that was, that's really well said, Meg. I think Definitely. You have to follow that inquiry all the way through and, you know, the process, the product, it's all, it's all so important. And I think there was um, a comment in here about, you know, taking a couple steps back and, and moving forward. And I think that's also, you know, progressive education in general, inquiry-based education, project-based education, you know, it's all about that like cyclical experience of growing and you know, moving backward, moving forward. And I mean, that's re the reality is that that, that is life. So if you can simulate those experiences for kids, I mean, what could be better preparation for life than that? Amelia, did you um did you happen to write a book on guided inquiry? I think there's I a book in that. there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I am, and I'm really passionate. Um, What's your I book? I think what got me so excited about guided inquiry it's called the Guided Inquiry Approach to Teaching the Humanities Research Project. <laughs> we could never, there's like three of them now. I'm sorry. Um, no, but I think what's really cool is that um, you see kids with learning disabilities gain confidence over time. And that's what got me convinced that guided inquiry is a good pedagogical approach because if you can make 
a learning disabled kid feel confident after a six, eight week research project, you know, you can make anybody feel confident. Mm -hmm. And I think that it doesn't take that much. Um, and I think that that's a lot of times what kids with learning disabilities need. I mean, at least in high school, I think that confidence in their abilities is so important. And that's why it is really important for them to know their abilities. And, um, you know, we'll, we have them write a lot of reflections. And that's usually what's kind of reflected um, is that they felt at, in the beginning that they didn't have a lot of confidence and then they come out feeling so confident. So, you know, we need more opportunities for kids to feel confident in education, I think. Um, it's it's as simple as that. And it's so funny because when Amelia and I first met, she kept talking about progressive education. Now, I haven't worked in education that long. It's been like a year. Um, and it was it was really, really funny where she's like, well, progressive education. I was like, I don't even know what that means. Like, all I know <laughs> is my traditional classroom <laughs> where, like, People were talking at me, I was bored, I wanted to stand up, and then I went to the next class and it didn't really matter if um, I got the information or not. It was just mm -hmm. pushed on to the next class and the next that subject. Experience in middle school, I mean, I was lucky, I was very, very, very lucky that I had the opportunity to go to private school, but I think that's the, that is the crux of the problem, like that creativity in school is dead imagination is suppressed and you know you get a lot of kids unable to take that experimental path toward you know whether that's through service learning or project-based learning or inquiry learning you know or roundtable discussions they're just they're, there aren't a lot of opportunities for that I mean there there definitely are more because I think we have some really 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 awesome teachers that are entering and I think there are just so many new approaches that people are experimenting with so it's possible. We just have to do more of it. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get the word out there. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up. Um, and and something um, something that we want to do on the podcast is, is um, we might have not followed this outline the whole time, but something we want to do is make sure that we have um, sort of a story, a breakthrough moment for one of our students, a tech tip, because we have – Jennifer Kronk over here, who is like a tech guru. Um, so not a guru, last... just a geek. <laughs> <laughs> so working it. Um, for sure. Um, the and then the last thing we want to do is um, is sort of end with uh, with gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's always important because we can we can talk about everything that's going wrong in our lives, but I always think that it's important to to be in the moment and um, and to be grateful that we wake up every morning and that we have that breath and that we can breathe and that we can smile and that we can cry and that we're alive. Um, and so gratitude is something that um, we just always have to find that silver lining, um, especially when you feel like you're all alone and in the darkness. Um, and so it's important to just have that little bit of light and that little bit of gratitude. Um, so Amelia, do you want to start off with your I gratitude for the week? I'm dying. So I, I just want to say that yesterday I got to spend the day with my grandmother and we went to Thai Kitchen, which is my favorite restaurant in our area. And I'm just so, um, so happy that I get to spend that time with her. I had the day off from school. Um, so it was just really, really wonderful to connect with her. And um, she's German and we were trying to figure out how to how I could get German citizenship so I could be a dual citizen, you know, just fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hanging out with my grandma. <laughs> um, and I'm just really grateful that for that. I'm 27 and I'm grateful that I have my grandmother. And yeah, I think that, that for me was huge. <laughs> Yeah, and, we, and I was telling Amelia that I was like, something that all of the kids with learning disabilities, I, I for sure know this now, and it makes so much sense, is that, well, first it's bad, because like, all the parents are like, they don't know how to hang out with like kids their own age, and I'm like, it's fine, like, I hang out with like women who are 40 or 50, or like little kids, like, the, like, to, like, the other 30 year olds, I'm like, I just... I don't know what it is. 
But it's like, it's so, it's always been like something like my parents would be like, we're having an adult party. And I'd be like, hanging out. I'm like, so what's going on at work, Bob? And I'm like, 12. Like, I don't even know. It's, yeah. No, because we know. We know where the wisdom is. We seek the wisdom. We yeah. know. Yeah. And we find the little kids who, like, remember to be their, like, little beautiful free selves. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Jill. Right. I want to sign off before my computer cuts me off. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank Thanks you. so much, Amelia. That was awesome. Bye, Mills. <laughs> All right. So the last, the last part of the segment. Um, to last tech tip. This past week, I've had this awesome opportunity to use. Now, I'm a. I do Google Apps professional development. I do all sorts of technology professional development. But this one particular tool that I'm going to tell you about, if you're used to using the Chrome browser and you have a child that has processing issues or coming from somebody who's dyslexic, there's a game-changing tool that I just recently started playing with called read write extension and it gives you this little toolbar and unfortunately i don't think blab has the opportunity for me to switch to um, a screencast view but i did do a small screencast and it is on my youtube channel uh you could just go to youtube and search jennifer Cronk. there's like three of my personas the one with the most videos is the one that has it um but the read write toolbar what it does which is so cool just in short it will read the text to the kids it will if a child highlights a word and clicks on the translator option i'll translate the word into either um, portuguese spanish french um i think italian but i'm not positive about that the other thing that i like is it has a dictionary but megan you're gonna love this it also has if i highlight a word and i go to dictionary and if you have a child who can't read and it opens up a dictionary passage not gonna help so the thing I, one of the things I love the most about the read, write toolbar is that it has a picture dictionary. So I hit, highlighted the word global and I hit the picture dictionary and showed me a bunch of clip art icons that showed globe, the world and surrounding the world. And I was like, that's, that rocks. I think that's awesome. Where was this when I was trying to learn how to read? And the other thing that I like is if a child goes through and highlights a bunch of words that they don't know, there's a tool in there that collects all the highlights and puts it on its own Google document. That's just called collecting highlights. The next one collects all those words and puts it in a grid. So you have the word, then you have the global, I mean, you have the picture dictionary showing you what it is. You have a dictionary entry. And then it has this extra column that you can have the kids. It automatically creates like a worksheet where the kids can use that in a sentence. Um, what? Yeah, That's it's awesome. crazy. Wait. Because you know when, like, but yeah, wait, you know there's when, like, more. I'm sorry. I'm it's okay. So I know. I'm like so excited too. Then it also takes dictation. So if you're, if you have a child or if you're somebody like me, where uh, honestly, I'm a much, I am much more efficient at speaking than I am at typing. And I'm a pretty fast typist. My son, for example, has uh, issues with articulation. So he receives speech. Uh, but he still, uh, and fine motor articulation, I meant to say, um, and he gets services for both. But for him, when he's doing an essay, he can use the voice recognition and it just talk to his uh, laptop and the laptop will actually record all the text for him. And then for the teacher, the teacher can highlight an area, insert a comment and record their voice. So it's, it's just like such an amazing tool. And it not just works in Google documents, but it also works on the browser. Go ahead, Meg. I know you want to say something. Okay. So there, so what you're saying is that there's the visual, there's the explanation, mm -hmm. there's the, um, the audio, yep. not, not only like speaking it, but also receiving the audio. That's really cool. Yeah, it's, I, and it's just something that one of the districts that I work for uh, wrote a grant and got this for all their kids, all their kids, K to 12. And I was like, you know, that's the way you do it. it it's you, t you give that tool that will be life changing for some, but provide it for all because it, it can only improve the, the mass of students, you know. And I, th I think what's also really interesting about that is every single time that I would read a dictionary, I'm like, so what does this mean? Like, mm -hmm. how am I supposed to use this? Like, yes. I don't get it. 
even still today, I'll be like, um, what does that word mean? Because yes. I'm just, just interested. It's great. And I need to hear the words spoken to me that I don't know because I still decode phonemes improperly. I can't sound words out right. No, not at all, for sure. Uh, some, yeah, we should like wrap this up, but I, will, I'm totally agree with you on um, not being able to spell out words because what we've ended up doing as our compensation is looking at a word, knowing what it's supposed to sound like, and we just memorize that. Like that's that's literally yeah. all we are doing. Yeah, um, which is kind of incredible. <laughs> <laughs> that we've memorized what every word looks like and what every word is supposed to sound like. So um, we want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in. This was so awesome. Uh, we This is our first blab, and um, we hope that you definitely tune in to Positively Special Ed. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer, for just getting this going. Um, any last words? No, I, like I said before, I think that, you know, when I met you and Amelia, it just definitely was like um, riding the momentum that you started in that session. I think that this is definitely uh, something that needs to be talked about and needs, it needs a voice, a very visual human voice that this is, this is a real issue that doesn't just affect a special ed classroom. This, you know, and I, I just really am so happy that I met up with you too. So I think the little tidbit for the week that I want to leave everyone with um, is to just stay focused. Um, and I hate when people tell me that, but I think um, the biggest thing is like to stay focused on your kids' happiness, right? Mm. And your happiness and sanity. Um, so stay focused. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks right, so much. Bye.